The world is full of urban decay. Buildings and structures from a bygone era, hiding in plain sight, records of what once was. Every city in the world has its own share of abandoned buildings, and Disney World is no different. Since opening in 1971, Walt Disney World has steadily accumulated its own set of abandoned and semi-abandoned show buildings, lounges, and even entire parks, invisible to most guests and closed to the public. But what's been proven over the years is that at Disney World, nothing is truly off limits. As mentioned in my last video on the disappearance of Wonders of Life animatronic Buzzy, Disney World has a long history of urban explorers delving into abandoned and behind the scenes areas. And it seems like a lot of you were really eager for me to take a more in-depth look at the world of Disney urban explorers. So today I thought I'd do just that and talk about the history of urban exploring at Disney World. Before I begin though, it's important I give a quick disclaimer. Urban exploring is trespassing and you should not attempt to access anywhere on Disney property you're not supposed to. If you do, you're risking serious injury, arrest, or being banned from the Disney parks. And depending on the sort of person you are, I don't know which one of those is worse. So with all that said, let's begin the story. And as with any good deep dive, I think we first need to go back to the very beginning. You know, it's really hard to pinpoint any precise moment that Disney World Urban Exploring started, because like most things of this nature, it didn't exactly start with one specific person or event, but rather with groups of vaguely connected people doing vaguely similar things until one of them decided to put it on the internet. But from the research I've done and from talking to various people, the earliest documented urban exploring I can find at Disney World was from two guys called Hoot and Chief, who are most well known in Disney circles for their extensive exploration of the old Horizons attraction in Epcot. Hoot and Chief were two best friends and Disney fanatics who met sometime in the late 1980s while working as custodians at Disney World. They quickly bonded over their mutual obsession with everything Disney and their interest in unorthodox activities. Throughout the late 80s and into the 90s, Hoot and Chief snuck into numerous Disney attractions, including Jungle Cruise, Pirates of the Caribbean, The River of Time, just about anything and everything that took their interest Hoot and Chief would be there. But more than any of that, Hoot and Chief are most famous for one attraction in particular, Horizons. The cult classic, legendary Epcot attraction about future living, now replaced by Mission Space, that many consider to be the very best attraction Disney has ever made. In an effort to document as much as they could before the ride closed, Hoot and Chief took regular trips into the ride, creating a system where they'd hang back from other guests in the queue to get a ride vehicle with no one else around, wait until they rounded the corner, then jump out once they were out of view while the ride was moving, climbing through the various attraction scenes on stage and backstage, sometimes spending hours at a time practically living inside of the attraction before getting back into their vehicle at the end of the ride and leaving like nothing happened. They also took extensive photos and video of their exploits eventually posting these years later to their Mesa Verde Times blog, showing the attraction from an angle and in a detail never before seen. Seriously, if you haven't seen these videos, they're an absolute Disney goldmine. There's just so much stuff there and it's really crazy that this much detail was available from the 90s. The full Hoot and Chief Horizon story has already been told in a fantastic documentary by Matthew Serrano, who does a much better job than I ever could, and I'll link in the description. Hoot and Chief's explorations of Horizons began sometime in the mid to late 90s, 
after the 1995 reopening of the ride. But there were of course several other self-styled missions they embarked on before Horizons, although few have an accompanying video due to how long ago it was. There is one trip though that does have video, the time when they entered Magic Kingdom armed with a video camera to shoot a home movie titled Hoot and Chief Scaled Chickapin Hill. But save Ruby because I kept it there. Oh. The briar pants go off. I can find pictures of other trips, but to my knowledge, this video is the earliest Hoot and Chief video I can find online, and may well be the earliest recorded footage of any Disney World urban exploring ever. In the video, Hoot and Chief broke into Splash Mountain at Magic Kingdom while the ride was still under construction walking up the ride track and taking video of the ride in its half-finished state. A lot of the video is pretty hard to make out due to it being taken late at night and also in 1992. But Hoot Gibson also posted additional photos on Twitter and his blogs over the years showing what they saw that night. Like this photo of a newly installed Br'er Rabbit animatronic sitting in the darkness. At one point while walking the tracks, they even discover that the main lift hill hasn't even been installed yet but they still decide to climb further up the mountain and capture this shot of Cinderella Castle in the distance. The Hoot and Chief explorations rank among the most dramatic videos Disney urban explorers have ever taken. Hoot and Chief sneaking around with hushed voices, paranoid of being caught, while the screams of guests riding Big Thunder can be heard faintly in the distance is honestly thrilling. And there are moments from the Horizons videos where they narrowly avoid getting caught at one point accidentally leaving a video camera out in the open as regular guests ride past. Part of these videos feel like something out of a movie, and I think with this being before social media and before tighter security in general around the Disney parks, Hoot and Chief really benefited from a sort of golden age of general Disney mischief that made them potentially the best to ever do it. But with the closure of Horizons in 1999, Hoot and Chief's adventures began to wind down, and it was up to more Disney explorers to take things further, venturing into more off-limits areas, this time not inside attractions, but underneath them. When Walt Disney walked around Disneyland in the 50s and 60s, so the story goes, he was bothered by the sight of a cowboy costumed cast member walking through Tomorrowland, as he felt this would shatter the illusion of guests. So when Magic Kingdom was built in Florida, Imagineers came up with an elaborate solution to ensure that no cast member would have to be seen in an area that didn't fit their theme, the Disney Utilidors an extensive network of underground utility tunnels with all the amenities employees could possibly need, allowing for cast members to get costumes, eat lunch, and travel from one area of the park to another completely out of sight from the guests above them, and an area that the average guest isn't even supposed to know about let alone be anywhere near. But sometime around the summer of 1995, Disney fan Leonard Kinsey, more commonly known as the Dark Side of Disney, and his two friends ventured into Magic Kingdom with one goal in mind, to sneak into and document the elusive Utilidors. Kinsey's book, released in 2011, documents their first adventure into the Utilidors. I read the book while researching for this video, and while its style of writing is very 2011, pretty outdated, and obviously embellished for dramatic effect, the story itself of the mission into the depths of Disney is still a pretty cool one. The friends went into the Magic Kingdom with a video camera and an ASCII art map of the supposed Utilidor system they had downloaded from an old school BBS server. Not wanting to draw attention to themselves, they even cut their hair to blend in with the Disney look guidelines at the time so as to not arouse suspicion. Then they headed straight to an entrance marked on the map next to Cinderella Castle. Initially thinking that the map had lied to them, they then noticed a bland, almost invisible set of double doors and realised that that must be the entrance they were looking for. Heading inside, they walked down a flight of stairs where they were faced with their first look at the fabled Utilidors. They documented the various coloured walkways, the cast member cafeteria, and the half-dressed Disney characters walking the corridors without their heads on, as cast members just ignored them assuming they also worked there. Finally, they made it up another staircase, which they found led them out of a similar nondescript door in the corner of Tomorrowland. Kinsey then spent several years taking trips to the Utilidors, sometimes just on his own, and sometimes, according to him, with as many as 15 people. 
occasionally capturing video. The footage you're watching right now, for example, isn't from his original trip, but from a trip he took in the summer of 1997. There have been reports of several other explorers going into the Utelador since Kinsey's videos, but since these were posted to the internet in 2011, security has now tightened up significantly. Exploring the Utelador's is cool, but I think it's lost a lot of the cool factor it had back in 2011, now that there's so much information available about them, even from Disney themselves. And with them still being in use, they don't have the same creepy, abandoned vibe that entices most urban explorers. For that, we instead have to go to the 2000s, and the greatest story Disney urban exploring has ever produced. Disney's Treasure Island opened on April 8, 1974, as a half-day attraction, featuring pirate-themed caves and shipwrecks for guests to explore. Not being very popular, it relaunched two years later in 1976, as a small wildlife exhibit where guests could see exotic birds, and was renamed to Discovery Island. Discovery Island was a naturally forming island in Disney's Bay Lake, the larger body of water to the east of Magic Kingdom that's home to the contemporary resort, Fort Wilderness, and formerly the River Country Water Park. Discovery Island being an island, guests had to take a boat to visit it, and so even after the relaunch it was never hugely popular. But it still managed to generate enough interest to stay open for more than 20 years. However, with the opening of Animal Kingdom in 1998, there became very little reason for guests to take the boat trip to see the animals at Discovery Island, when they could instead see much more wildlife at the much larger Animal Kingdom. And so a year later in 1999, Discovery Island closed permanently. Initially, Disney said they were busy planning what would replace the attraction, even keeping the lights on on the island at night to maintain the illusion that it was still occupied. But as time went on, it became clear that this was not the case, and that Discovery Island was in fact completely abandoned. The boat dock was eventually removed to discourage guests from attempting landings, and any chance of a new life for the island became slimmer and slimmer as the place fell into disrepair. But come on, a former Disney attraction rotting away on an island in the middle of a Florida lake? It was practically begging to be explored. On Christmas Day 2009, photographer and urban explorer Shane Perez put out a blog post on his website about a trip he went on five years earlier. In the post, Shane explains that he and his friends had heard about the existence of the abandoned island from several locals, who had told them rumours that animals had been left behind there and were running wild. At this point, it wasn't really known what was on the island, as there were no confirmed visits by members of the public in the five years since it closed. Nonetheless, eager to reach and to document Discovery Island, Perez and his friends devised a plan. The locals they had spoken to had told them that Discovery Island was around a hundred feet off the shore of Bay Lake, near the Fort Wilderness campground across a stretch of water with infrequent boat traffic. Taking the Disney World shuttle buses, they would smuggle an inflatable boat, a hand pump, a few oars, and 150 feet of clothesline with them to Fort Wilderness, then venture through the also abandoned River Country water park to reach the shore. From there, the lack of boat traffic would make for an easy crossing, where they could ferry themselves back and forth across the water using the clothesline without being spotted. But when they finally got to the shore of Bay Lake, they discovered that the information they received was completely wrong. Discovery Island was not 100 feet from the shore, but more than 300 feet. And to make matters worse, Disney ferries were crossing between them every five to 10 minutes, taking guests from Fort Wilderness to Magic Kingdom, meaning that if they attempted to take their boat across the water, they'd almost definitely be spotted. Defeated and deflated, it would take nearly a year for Perez and friends to return with a new plan. This one was simpler and much quieter. They were just swim to the island. Perez and his friends were not here to mess around though, pre-planning their trip to make sure it would be successful by testing themselves at swimming equivalent distances in other Florida lakes and setting a hard turnaround time while on the island equivalent to something like an ocean dive. Arriving at the edge of river country under the cover of darkness, after the Disney ferries had stopped for the day, Perez and his friends swam in a beeline for the closest point on the island, carrying with them waterproof bags containing their clothes, cameras, food, and any other minimal equipment they might need. After the swim, the group finally landed on the island and immediately stashed their equipment among the thick undergrowth. What they discovered was that the place had become the nesting ground for hundreds of birds, making noise all around them. Further into the island, it was clear to Perez that it hadn't been maintained at all, 
The place was hugely overgrown, with paths almost completely invisible, and nature well on its way to reclaiming every building. In a storage building they found old paperwork and photos of the island in its heyday, left behind by cast members, now unable to be recovered, suggesting that the abandonment of Discovery Island was sudden. They also found what seemed to be jars of preserved snakes, one in a bottle of Diet Coke. Yet further still, they found a canopied enclosure, which they thought was a former bird exhibit, and in one of them were two young vultures, who hissed at them and charged them until they left. At this point, Shane and his friends had spent three hours searching the island, and had only covered half of it. But with the sun coming up in the early hours of the morning, and the first of the ferries starting up again, they decided to end their trip here, and head back to the mainland. A few years after Shane Perez's trip, Another urban explorer named Nomius from the Florida urban exploration group Flurbex also made a trip to Discovery Island. In 2007, Nomius and several other Flurbex members commandeered Disney boats and docked them on the shore of the island, posting several more photos to the internet, documenting more cast member areas and artifacts left behind in higher resolution than before. This trip was the second known trip to Discovery Island by an explorer, but was the first to be posted online, as Shane Perez actually waited until Florida's statute of limitations on trespassing had expired to post his photos. It's also a very annoying trip to research because while I remember reading about it sometime around 2013 or 14, the blog post associated with it has since been deleted, so there's very little information available. If it weren't for the fact that this is the only Disney exploring trip he made, I'd say that Shane Perez rivals Hooten Chi for the title of best ever. And I think the reason for that is that Shane Perez wasn't a typical Disney trespasser, but actually a seasoned urban explorer who regularly explored non-Disney places. In fact, if you've ever seen the documentary on YouTube about the guy that explores New York City, you'll have seen Shane Perez because he makes a cameo in that video. The story of the two trips to Discovery Island were the craziest stories of exploring yet, and achieved legendary status among many Disney fans, even going beyond the Disneyverse hitting the local news. With this, Disney urban exploring had been thrust into the mainstream, exposing a once relatively unknown hobby for an adventurous few to the wider world. And now that Pandora's box had been opened, many more people were keen to get in on the fun. Around the same time as the release of the images from Discovery Island, urban exploring started to gain more and more traction on social media, particularly on YouTube. Throughout 2011, Leonard Kinsey uploaded several videos of the parks to promote his book, The Dark Side of Disney. Some of these were the Utilidor videos from the 90s, but some were of new explorations, such as a venture into the upstairs image works at Epcot. Before 1998, the Imagination Pavilion used to feature a larger Journey into Imagination ride, featuring the much-loved character Dreamfinder, which took up the entire ground floor, with the exhibits at the exit of the attraction instead being located upstairs. This area known as Image Works featured several similar exhibits as it does today, but was much more fleshed out and housed an iconic rainbow tunnel that featured in many Epcot promotional images through the 80s and 90s, including some featuring Michael Jackson. But with the changing of the attraction, first to journey into your imagination, and then to journey into imagination with Figment, Imageworks was moved downstairs. The ride was shortened, and instead of the upstairs area being repurposed, it was simply shut, with many exhibits left exactly as they were in the 90s, and the rainbow tunnel switched off. Imageworks was a much more achievable exploring opportunity than somewhere like Discovery Island, for example, as the downstairs area of the building was open year round, and you simply had to slip past a rope to get upstairs. And so as a result, numerous explorers went up to Imageworks around this time, making it a sort of de facto first exploring trip for many people. One of the many explorers of Imageworks was YouTuber Adam the Woo, who released a video of the area in 2011 and continued to explore other areas of Walt Disney World after that. Sometime in the years following, the area was finally repurposed as a DVC rest area, with seating and phone charging stations installed in the landing area and walls blocking off deeper parts of the floor. But Imageworks wasn't the end of it for Disney urban exploring. Several years after Shane Perez's blog post and the home videos of Leonard Kinsey and Hooten Chief, YouTube was now the home to many videos from dozens of explorers. And this was only the beginning. Throughout the early 2010s, YouTubers like Adam the Woo and Leonard Kinsey continued to post videos of every area at the Walt Disney World Resort they could find. After Imageworks came VIP lounges around Epcot, areas hidden in pavilions that were previously previously meant as private spaces for the corporate sponsors of attractions, such as General Electric, Kraft, and General Motors, 
some still in use, others empty. After this, videos were shown posting peeks behind the curtains at the closed Wonders of Life pavilion, an entire area that formerly housed two major attractions and was now mostly unused, with some areas being temporarily repurposed for Epcot's festivals. And if you want the full story on that, you should watch my previous video on the buzzy animatronic. And among these explorations came full video of River Country, Walt Disney World's first water park, closed and left abandoned in 2001, and to date, the only Disney park in the world to permanently close. River Country, of course, had been infiltrated already, several times, as it being on the mainland in a secluded area near Fort Wilderness made it an easy target to explore without being spotted. It was River Country that had been the staging ground for the daring Discovery Island expedition by Shane Perez in 2004, and it was River Country that had been the first major success online for Adam the Woo. But now, encouraged by the draw of more YouTube views, we were finally getting full video of River Country. Long meandering tours of the dilapidated water slides and empty plunge pool, signage still up in the park, and the music of Fort Wilderness playing faintly in the distance. I've been hearing about River Country for over 10 years now, and while that's meant that I have got a bit bored of hearing all this stuff about it, I think this is still the coolest abandoned Disney thing there is. The YouTubers of the early 2010s sparked an explosion of interest in abandoned Disney history. It was something of a perfect time for this sort of thing to go viral, considering this era was full of abandoned, haunted, kid stuff, creepypastas and the like. This content got a whole generation of Disney fans absolutely hooked on lost and forgotten Disney history like never before. I'd even go as far as to say that entire YouTube channels, many of whom are the largest Disney content creators on the platform today, owe much of their initial success to this urban exploring craze of the 2010s. Disney urban exploring was now in full swing. Propelled by YouTube and the thirst for more content, constantly bigger and better and more outlandish. But by the mid-2010s, most of the low-risk places Imageworks, Wonders of Life, The Odyssey, VIP lounges had already been combed over by anyone and everyone. Even places like River Country had more than enough footage available. But there was still one place that hadn't gotten the modern YouTube treatment. Discovery Island hadn't been visited to anyone's knowledge since Flurbex in 2007, and there was no video of it whatsoever. And neither Flurbex nor Shane Paris had ever managed to explore the island in its entirety. Video footage of Discovery Island in full would be the holy grail of urban exploration. And in 2017, Disney fans were about to get it. What's up YouTube, my name is Matt Sonsois. I'm here at Disney's Discovery Island. I was here a couple days ago and I uploaded a couple videos but wasn't satisfied with the quality so I got some better equipment and here I am. In May of 2017, seemingly out of nowhere, a new urban explorer named Matt Sonswa uploaded a one hour video of a full trip to Discovery Island. What's even more remarkable about the video is that Matt and his friends had already made the trip a couple of days earlier, but weren't satisfied with the quality of the video they had made, so decided to go back to do it right. Like Flurbex before them, they made the trip to the island in an inflatable boat and came across all the usual sights explorers had seen before them. The preserved snakes, the photos, the numerous birds nesting on the island, but they also found much more in much greater detail. A calendar on the wall reading December 1999, employee shifts marked on a whiteboard, maintenance areas, the old avian way walkway, animal storage, more former exhibits never documented in previous trips. As with before, the island was hugely overgrown, and Matt and his friend Chris struggled to walk around several areas. It's been said before by other YouTubers, and I agree too, that out of all the abandoned things I've seen online, even outside of Disney, Discovery Island is a unique place, because unlike most areas where they've been practically torn apart by looters and squatters, Discovery Island has been left almost entirely untouched by people, only being damaged by nature taking hold once again. According to a Reddit post, Matt Sonswa went back to Discovery Island a further nine times, even staying on the island overnight. The island that had been subject to extensive planning the previous decade was now just a regular destination. The video of course garnered massive attention, which encouraged Matt to go to other Disney sites, 
quickly gaining a reputation as the most daring explorer. He started releasing videos of Cranium Command and Body Wars at Wonders of Life, delving deeper into the attraction than any of his predecessors. He went to River Country, Epcot VIP lounges, he went up close to the old man and dog animatronics in Magic Kingdom. Eventually though, this wasn't enough, and he started pushing to get footage of things no one else had got close to. In 2017, Disney Quest closed its doors at Disney Springs, the outdoor shopping mall area of Disney World. Disney Quest was a massive, multi-story building, an indoor interactive theme park, basically an arcade on steroids, with all the typical arcade games and many other scaled up experiences. Matt released a video some three months after Disney Quest's closure while it was being actively dismantled to make way for the NBA experience. In order to get into the building, he disguised himself as a construction worker sneaking his camera inside in a lunchbox to film the half-dismantled structure sitting in the darkness. To this day, Matt remains the only known explorer to sneak into Disney Quest. And if this video wasn't enough to win viewers over, what about a video of the inside of Interventions before its removal? Maybe inside of Stitch's Great Escape after it had shut? How about climbing across the tracks of Big Thunder Mountain? And if all of these videos, each one crazier and more dangerous than the next, still weren't enough for you, how about the time Matt dirt biked across Florida Swampland to get into the backstage of Animal Kingdom, broke into Expedition Everest, climbed inside the mountain, and touched the Yeti, the hulking 25 foot tall animatronic sitting semi-broken inside the working Animal Kingdom ride. Video about the story of that animatronic also on my channel. Matt Sonswell was pushing the limits of what people would dare to attempt at Disney World, and many thought that maybe we had now hit the limit. Many also thought that Matt and the other explorers, if they hadn't been already, were now playing a dangerous game, and it was only a matter of time before something went seriously wrong. So far, I've simply recounted the stories of these explorations, and it would be easy enough to assume that nothing ever came of these events, that people kept exploring the parks, and that was it. But I'm sure some of you have been wondering, what did Disney think about all of this? After all, by the late 2010s, there was now an infestation of vloggers and clout chasers, eager to recreate what they'd seen online, breaking into various sites around Disney World. More people had attempted to go to places like River Country, Wonders of Life, and even Discovery Island, hoping to make vlogs to rake in some YouTube money or just gain some notoriety. Would Disney just sit by and let this happen? Of course they wouldn't. Shane Perez and Nomius were both permanently banned from the parks shortly following their postings about Discovery Island. Adam the Woo was banned in 2013 in relation to several of his videos about backstage areas, although this ban was lifted in 2050. Matt Sonswa was of course banned from Disney, and in 2020, Orange County Sheriff's deputies released body cam footage of them hunting down and arresting a man who had attempted to spend quarantine on Discovery Island. In the late 2010s, there were even some reports of people getting banned, albeit temporarily, simply for poking a camera through or around a fence. Disney were not taking this new alternative hobby lightly. If you had trespassed anywhere on Disney property and you'd posted about it online, there was a pretty high chance you'd end up getting banned. Many Disney fans raised questions about the ethics of urban exploring. Urban exploring has never been okay, so to speak, but early urban explorers for the most part did relatively little harm. Putin Chief did take some small items from Horizons, yes, and I guess trespassing in any capacity is never good, but in my opinion, in the early days, nothing egregious was going on. But now the clout chase was underway, and younger, bolder YouTube vloggers were now competing against each other to do crazier stunts in larger numbers than before, there was concern that they wouldn't be so respectful. Maybe they would damage the areas they were exploring, or maybe they would steal souvenirs and attempt to sell them online. This all came to a head in late 2018 when a Twitter user who had been posting backstage photos and video was arrested by Orange County Police in connection with a case involving the alleged theft of clothing from the Haunted Mansion and from the famed Buzzy animatronic from the abandoned Cranium Command attraction. At around the same time as urban explorers were venturing into Cranium Command, Buzzy himself had gone missing leading many to speculate that an urban explorer had stolen him in an attempt to sell him to a collector. And if you'd like to hear the full story of what is possibly the wildest mystery in Disney World history, 
check out my previous video on Buzzy's disappearance. Buzzy's disappearance and the arrest of this explorer caused a lot of Disney fans' opinions to sour on urban exploring as a whole. Disney was now clamping down hard on trespassers, and the hobby had gone from being a morally grey but still secretly admired pastime to something that would make you a pariah among fans. In the years following the Buzzy debacle, the interest in urban exploring has slowed down quite a bit. I think it really showed Disney fans how easy a thing it was for bad actors to exploit for personal gain, and so most people now don't want much to do with it. There are still videos being posted every now and again, but between Disney being much more on top of trespassing than they once were, and the diminished interest for footage, urban exploring is no longer in the heyday it once was. It's a shame what ended up happening to Disney urban exploring, but I guess in a way it was only a matter of time. Once something like that hits the internet, it's not exactly possible to keep it the way it was, and it becomes inevitable that it gets taken over by greed and arrogance. That's not to say that the original groups of urban explorers were saints in any way, but at least they were a little bit more cautious with it. Urban exploring as a whole has become such a massive genre on YouTube that this stuff really did just devolve into a clout chase. I suppose there's also an element too that urban exploring was just getting old. Back in the 90s and even the 2000s, there was still a lot of mystery to these sites, with so many rumours flying around, and anybody that dared to explore these places was really delving into uncharted territory which made the exploring all the more exciting. But once there were a dozen different influences going after each site, the mystery was totally gone, and any questions that remained could just be answered with a quick Google search. Despite the sketchiness surrounding the hobby, Disney Urban Exploring still continues to fascinate me, as it's the only way we're able to see what became of these places that would otherwise be completely lost. And for that reason, like it or not, Urban exploring is deserving of a spot in Disney Parks history. Thanks for watching my video on Disney Urban Exploring. I feel like I say this every time now with these videos, but this has been the largest video I've ever worked on in terms of scope, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing me talk about the topic. Urban exploring history is such a mystery in many ways, as not every urban explorer has documented their adventures, and with a lot of this stuff happening pre-internet, it's pretty hard to piece together any sort of definitive timeline, so please keep that in mind before you tell me I left something out in the comments. I said it near the start of the video, but I'll say it again. This is in no way an endorsement of urban exploring at Disney World, or urban exploring anywhere for that matter. Urban exploring is still trespassing and can be incredibly dangerous, and it's suddenly something that I've never done, and I suggest you don't try to do it either. But for me, the most interesting stories are the ones not about the history of places and things, but of people, and how we interact with each other and the world around us. And this makes Disney Urban Exploring a very interesting, and not to sound too dramatic, but a pretty important thing to document. If you liked the video, please consider subscribing. I also need to say thank you to everyone who's subscribed so far, because as of releasing my last video, this channel has now surpassed a thousand subscribers, which is honestly great. And there'll be lots more videos on the way for you all to watch. If you have any ideas for something you'd like me to cover next, please let me know. And as always, I'll see you next time.